name is Stuart Thorson. I'm with the Korean Peninsula Affairs Center here in the Maxwell School, and I want to welcome you to another Donald P. and Margaret Curry Gregg symposium, which we do periodically focusing on um, the Korean Peninsula. The Korean Peninsula Affairs Center is a part of the Moynihan Institute um, here in the Maxwell School, um, and we focus on contemporary issues of public policy, governance, um, these kinds of things, and, and as they affect the Korean Peninsula. Our symposium series is really put together to recognize Don and Meg Gregg, whose dedicated and thoughtful work in Korea um, and Asia more broadly is very much in the spirit of the Maxwell School. And many of you have met the two of them in various contexts, and you, I think, can fully appreciate what I mean by that. Both of them have also been staunch supporters of the Maxwell School's uh, scholarly interest in Korea. In addition, I want to acknowledge the Pacific Century Institute and the Henry Luce Foundation for their incredibly valuable support of the work we've been doing over the past really 10 years now here in Maxwell on Korea. And also, um, and probably in some ways most importantly in a local sense, um, the graduate students, Rogelio, who was back there hiding behind a camera, and Shin, who is back here, um, helping to make sure everybody gets, gets in on time. Together with, I haven't seen Nick from the Moynihan Institute, who did a lot of the logistic planning for this as well. Um, the ICT group, who's back there making the webcast all work, and Kathy Cicerelli from the Dean's Office, who's really been tremendously helpful in getting all this coordinated. Now, on to the more substantive stuff. Um, this December 19th, South Korea will hold its presidential election. This occurs just two days after the anniversary of the death of Kim Jong-il in the North, and the beginning of the Kim Jong-un era, era um, there. Early this month, of course, the U.S. re-elected Barack Obama as its president, and a day later, China began a formal process that led to its leadership change. Our topic today is implications of all this for the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia. And we've got a great group of people, not including me, of course, well positioned to discuss this. Uh, each of them will make 10 to 15 minutes worth of comments, and my real job is to make sure that they don't go beyond that. Um, and let me introduce them in the order in which they'll speak and then turn it over really to the panel. The first speaker will be uh, James Steinberg. Jim is Dean of the Maxwell School, of course, and has had a distinguished career um, combining really scholarship with public service. He's been Dean of the LBJ School, Director of Foreign Policy Studies at Brookings, President Clinton's Deputy Security, National Security Advisor, and right up until joining the Maxwell School was Deputy Secretary of State under Hillary Clinton. In that capacity, Jim played a leading role in architecting current U.S. policy toward Northeast Asia. And he is just back from a couple trips, one to China and one to South Korea, and probably others I'm totally unaware of. Um, on his left is Alexander Ilichev, who is a senior officer in the Asia and Pacific Division of the U.N. Secretariat's Department of Political Affairs. His responsibilities are focused on regional peace and security, with specifically on the Korean Peninsula. And in that capacity, he's um, accompanied Secretary General Bonn on trips to the region. Prior to joining the UN, Alexander served in the USSR Foreign Ministry, including assignments from there to the United Nations and to their embassy in Washington, D.C. In addition to all these official positions, you can read about them. Um, he's a remarkably um, perceptive and thoughtful analyst of um, Northeast Asia. Um, and you'll sense that, I think, as he begins to talk with us. We're really fortunate that he was willing to take a day to come up to Maxwell and Syracuse to share some of his thoughts. And last, but by no means least, that's me, is Fred Carrier, who is the Pacific Institute Senior Fellow in our Korean Peninsula Affairs Center. He's also a research professor in the Department of Political Science and has an academic appointment at Stanford University. Fred has lived in Korea for over 20 years and served there as executive director of the Korean Fulbright Commission. Prior to coming to SU, Fred was executive vice president of the Korea Society, where he worked with Don Gregg, who was the chairman. Fred has worked with Syracuse since the beginning of our now, I think, 11-year collaboration and work with Kim Chek University of Technology and North Korea State, National, um, State Academy of Sciences. Fred has also helped to coordinate the New York Philharmonic's historic 2008 concert in Pyongyang, which is one of the prime examples, I think, of public diplomacy with regard, at least, to North Korea. 
And he is just back from a Track 2 meeting in Vienna, which among other things involved officials from North Korea and the United States. So we've got a good group of people with some very relevant and current information about what's going on, and hopefully we'll have something of a um, spirited discussion about the interpretation of it. As I say, each will speak for around 10 to 12 minutes, then we'll open it up for discussion um, with the audience, and I hope that's a big part of what we do. And then at the very end, there'll be a reception in the rear, so you can talk individually with them. So with that, let me turn it over to Jim. Thanks, Stu, and thanks to all of you for coming, and to Alexander and Fred for being on this uh, panel. It's, a, it's an excellent time, obviously, to have this discussion because uh, everything seems possible and nothing seems certain right now in terms of uh, uh, developments on the Korean Peninsula. It's a, a time in which there is, a, I think, a lot of uncertainty, which has, uh, depending on whether you see this as glass half full or glass half empty, uh, either some real prospects for you know, thinking that the, the current stalemate can be broken or reasons to be concerned that we are uh, moving into yet another uh, period of potential crisis. And, if you read uh, the reports in the paper these days, and I happily no longer privileged any inside information, uh, one recognizes that the risks uh, are there as well as the, uh, as the possibilities. Um, these elections and these leadership changes are obviously enormously consequential in terms of Korean Peninsula policy. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the re-election of the president uh, suggests that the, the core orientation is likely uh, to remain similar, although I think that uh, it's important to unpack really what's been behind the uh, Obama administration's policy uh, for the last four years to really understand what the future might hold. And then, of course, uh, on, in Korea itself, the, although we clearly don't know who's going to be the next president of South Korea, uh, I think it's certain that we will see at least some uh, elements of change in the policy. All the candidates have indicated that to some degree or another they see points of departure from the, the current administration. And then finally, the, the, the biggest unknown of all these unknown unknowns is uh, the situation in the North itself. And I'm looking forward to both Alexander and, and Fred answering these questions for me. I certainly try to watch it carefully, but I will not even pretend to profess that I understand the, the long-term strategy or even how much there is a strategy at the moment uh, in the leadership, such as whatever the leadership might be uh, in North Korea today. So let me start, I think, from the U.S. perspective. Um, from the beginning, and I think it's important to emphasize this, um, President Obama uh, was a firm believer that uh, the clear preference in terms of how to move forward with the situation on the peninsula uh, was to try to advance uh, diplomatic understandings both in the North-South and the U.S.-North Korea uh, dimensions. That uh, while there had been lots of questions and issues about how the Bush administration had gotten to the 2005 understanding and how that was being implemented, that unlike at the beginning of the Bush administration where the Bush administration came into office with a fundamental desire to rethink policy, the president signaled at the outset that uh, he was willing to, to move forward on the track that had been established by uh, President Bush, Secretary Rice, and Assistant Secretary Hill. And the, uh, the downturn in relations uh, stemmed primarily from the decision by the North Korean government in the spring of uh, 2009 to test the new administration with a missile launch. Um, the table was set very clearly at the time. The administration made clear that uh, while it wanted to move forward with diplomacy, it would view a missile launch as uh, a sign that um, North Korea was not interested in continuing uh, in a more uh, diplomatic track, and notwithstanding that, those communications, the North uh, Korea went forward. And that led clearly to a, a more contentious period in, in uh, U.S.-North Korean relations. But throughout the time and throughout the, the first term of President Obama, the willingness to return to a diplomatic track was always uh, very explicit as part of the policy, and no more evidence of that than what uh, we saw in the, uh, the, the February 29th uh, 2012 uh, near agreement or, or putative agreement between um, uh, negotiators for the United States and South Korea in Beijing in which uh, it appeared that the two sides had uh, developed a, a track to move forward to put this back on diplomatic terms and in a pattern which unfortunately is not unfamiliar uh, in dealings between the United States and North Korea history unhappily repeated itself and Notwithstanding the clear warnings to the North that another missile launch would derail that understanding, the North went ahead in April of 2012 with, um, with the missile launch. So 
uh, again, not speaking for the administration, but I think it, it will be very clear going forward that the inclination of the president is still to, to, to seek a diplomatic path forward uh, with the North. But there are two things that will be a necessary condition for that to take place. The first is that, that any uh, improvement and substantive negotiation between uh, the United States and North Korea has to be accompanied by significant uh, engagement and not just pro forma engagement between the North and the South. That uh, the United States is not interested in a strategy in which the North might try to drive a wedge between South Korea and the United States by making progress between the United States uh, and uh, North Korea without making progress on inter-Korean issues. Um, I think the president will be flexible, and I'll get to this in a minute, in terms of what happens on the South Korean side as to what needs to happen in the, in the North-South track. But I think it, it will continue to be an important part of US policy that the two tracks not become uh, disconnected. The second, which is a familiar piece of the policy, is that um, there, there's no, uh, I think, inclination on the part of the president uh, to somehow feel that it's the responsibility of the United States now to offer further inducements to North Korea to move forward with negotiations in advance of significant steps by North Korea. The, the, the beauty of the February 29th agreement was that both sides had, undertake, had made some undertakings to do some substantively significant things which is why the United States was willing to enter into that February 29th agreement. I don't anticipate that something somehow less than that uh, on the part of North Korea is likely to produce a more forthcoming uh, response on the US side. So again, we'll have a new Secretary of State and the President may have different views, but my anticipation is that those are going to be the, the overall perspective, a desire to move back, to find a way out of the stalemate, but a recognition that there has to be, this has to be done in a, in a context in which there is progress with, between the North and South, and some clear sign that the, the North is looking to deal with the, the United States' concerns and not just addressing North Korea's concerns about the United States. On the South Korean side, you've all followed this, I know at least most of you in the room very carefully, all of the candidates clearly uh, have indicated a desire uh, to find a way to make progress, to look for new openings uh, to engage um, with the North. I think there are shades of difference here and I don't want to be the one who tries to parse the, the platforms of the, of the South Korean candidates. You can all read them for yourselves and make your own judgments. But I think that, and so I do think there are, there are differences of emphasis in terms of what each would look forward. But they, they clearly have a desire to try to move forward in a fairly expeditious way with uh, enhanced North-South contact. But again, if you look at the past, there was at least a brief moment uh, about a year ago in which there seemed to be a potential opening beginning with mill, mill talks between the North and the South, which didn't go anywhere. And so one has to ask the question that even if there's a greater openness on the part of a new president in South Korea, just what is North Korea prepared to do? And I think in the end, that is the $64,000 question. We can spend a lot of time talking about <clears throat> what the Obama administration might be prepared to agree to or what a new South Korean government would be prepared to do, to do. but what, what, is the, what is the game plan now in the North? Uh, and that, of course, is partially a function of how settled the transition is and who is now in charge uh, in North Korea and how that person or persons now understand the North Korean interest. Uh, is there uh, a renewed interest in trying to deal with the fundamental economic and social problems in North Korea in a way that would make that leadership more open to uh, some kind of accommodation between North and South and, uh, and North Korea and the United States? Or is the need to continue to mobilize the population around an enemy uh, a significant barrier to the willingness of the leadership in the North to make significant moves on its side in return for significant moves uh, from the South and from the United States? I, you know, have not seen affirmative evidence that the North is prepared to move in that direction, but that doesn't prove that there isn't. And it has certainly been the case that nobody expected significant gestures from the North during this period of transition on the United States and the South Korean side. So we can't, you know, necessarily infer from the fact that we haven't seen significant signs from the North up till now of a new openness to negotiation that 
it, that following the December 12th election, that there might be some new diplomatic flurry thereafter. I certainly hope that's the case, but I'm not, I'm not predicting it. I think it's fair to say that, although I think there was a significant breakdown in trust by the, the missile launch in April, I think everybody understands that the context was a unique one, given that it took place both during this period of transition and in the context of the anniversary celebration for Kim Il-sung. So although it was a bad sign that the, that the North took actions, which I believe it knew would lead to the breakdown of February 29th agreement, I also don't infer from that 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 is a settled policy of the North. So the most optimistic I can offer is that there, there are reasons to think that, that the bad pattern of recent times is not necessarily a harbinger of the future, but I can't reach the, the, the converse conclusion either, which is that somehow we can be optimistic that the North is ready to open a new chapter. But I do think if there, if there is willingness on the side of the North, there's at least, the, 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 the stars are aligned reasonably well on the side of both the United States and the South to move forward. And I guess the last note I would say, again, without speaking for the administration, but I know it gets asked a lot, which is that if the new leadership in the South is inclined to make a more forthcoming gesture uh, towards uh, the North, it's my guess, but again, I'm not speaking for the administration, that, that Washington will be open to being supportive as long as there is good consultation, as long as there are no surprises, as long as any move by the new leadership, the new president of South Korea, isn't done in a way that blindsides the United States. That would be a problem, we've seen that in the past, but I think the, the president understands and values the bilateral relationship and that that relationship is, is so important that it's imperative that the United States be open to new thinking on the, the side of the South as it develops the U.S. policy going forward. How Thanks do very much. Still, Perfect. Right? You have two minutes left. You wanted to say anything? <laughs> Alexander. Thank you so much. <clears throat> well, let me say a couple of words first that uh, I really feel that uh, it's a very special occasion for me because I consider Donald Gregg and his wife to be the symbol of integrity and uh, public service that I hope uh, others uh, would follow. <clears throat> And uh, public service, of course, uh, requires the people uh, uh, not only to be con con concerned, uh, 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 but also uh, to care, to do your job with passion. You have to care about the things you are doing, just because it relates to the much bigger public interests, uh, whether it relates to national governments or the international organization like the United Nations I work for. So I hope that, uh, specifically with relation to young people whom I see here, and let me be clear, I believe in the saying is the, not the number of dogs in the fight that matters. It's the fighting of those who take part in the fighting, uh, the fighting strands that matters. So the fact that you're here, that you came to listen, uh, and I, uh, I don't feel humbled uh, too often at my age, frankly. Actually, I don't feel humbled at all. But uh, I really appreciate a chance uh, to find myself in the company of the people. I feel uh, I really can learn a lot and uh, to exchange views who thinking people. And certainly, your dean is uh, one of them, um, as well as uh, both distinguished uh, professors uh, that are here on the panel. And I mean it. I usually, I basically practice uh, when I don't want to say something, I usually stay silent. So when I say something, I mean it. Uh, so this is what I mean. Um, we came here to talk about things that, in, uh, and I don't know how people understand diplomacy. Everybody seems to have to understand it, like everybody understands uh, uh, medicine and what to do about it and so on. The same about diplomacy. But diplomacy is not really um, about nice things. It's about problems. It's resolving problems. And this is the, not only profession, it's the art. And the Korean Peninsula, and increasingly, uh, because you have to look at it uh, in the wider perspective of uh, Northeast Asia, given what's going on there, 
it's a real challenge, professionally and uh, intellectually. Because uh, I will uh, tell you something that uh, most probably all of you or most of you already know. The challenge of this uh, set of issues is that nobody has uh, or doesn't know an answer to it. It's as simple as this. Uh, it's good when people know what they are going for, trying to achieve. Because very often I don't have this feeling that those who make decisions really uh, are clear with themselves what is it that what they are doing is about uh, in the real meaning of this sense. But this is this, uh, the, the, the region where the people, especially the decision makers, have to ask this question. Because um, uh, coming from the UN, where every country that uh, have been mentioned or not uh, yet mentioned here is a member of the United Nations, including the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. So as an international public servant, uh, I will excuse myself from qualifying or even intimating what I think has been done right or wrong. Uh, I will leave it to you and to other panelists. But uh, I would allow myself to look, been here at Maxwell School of Public Affairs, and I'm really impressed uh, not only by the scope of the university, uh, but uh, when I said that people, you should care when dealing with public affairs. And when I saw the pictures of some of uh, the young people who perished in this uh, Lockerbie bombing, uh, I mean, that was, I mean, it has a meaning for me. I hope you carry these kind of things uh, to your life because this is what should be inside of you, motivating you to do better and better every time, despite of the scope of the challenge. So I would allow myself to look at this whole set of issues, which I publicly acknowledge uh, personally, even though I've been trained initially uh, uh, 40 years ago as a Middle East expert, and uh, actually my first assignment was in Syria. Uh, I think that the Korean Peninsula is by far the most challenging gamut of issues in the world, because it brings together everything history, uh, specific relationships, um, uh, current challenges related to non-proliferation, weapons of mass destruction, uh, the aspirations of people, and so on and so forth. It's unique in this sense, as far as I'm concerned. So you should not be really uh, surprised if uh, you decide to make your contribution, as I would encourage all of you to try to make, uh, to have this in mind. I would look at this uh, situation not from uh, the uh, four years uh, uh, term perspective or 10 years, uh, 20 years perspective. Just think 20 years ago, 92, no nuclear weapons. I mean, the Cold War just ended, all these aspirations, all these hopes and everything. Uh, most of them for the better. Some of them still wait for their <coughs> Uh, definite answer. Um, but certainly as far as the Korean Peninsula is concerned, despite of ups and downs in uh, diplomatic efforts, engagement, disengagement, as if we talk about North Korea and others who is related to this uh, uh, set of issues in their own way is concerned, the partial engagement, uh, uh, big achievements as far as I'm concerned uh, when we talk about 94 framework agreement, the 2005 joint statement of the six party talks. Huge achievements, huge achievements. But the net result today, on November 20, 2012, uh, is that there are no permanent peace arrangements on the peninsula. We have uh, the state that claims uh, to be a nuclear weapon state. Moreover, uh, which stands by its intention uh, to stay there and go forward unless and until. So, and it's hugely important uh, to know the setup in terms of leadership because at the end of the day, it's the decisions and the policies that have been uh, put in place uh, are important. But equally important is their implementation. This is another lesson that uh, we should have learned from these 20 years of uh, uh, 
experience related to this region. Uh, so uh, I agree with the, um, uh, the dean that uh, it's the time of hope, even professionally, because if the decision makers everywhere think that their main goal is to really go towards durable peace, non-nuclear uh, Korean Peninsula, prosperous, uh, with human rights in place for everybody, then it should be obvious how to do it. I mean, all, all the elements uh, for this kind of thing are there, but you have to put them right. Because as I said, the answer is not there. You have to build it. I believe that all the necessary components are known, uh, they're on the table, so it just requires a team. Because another lesson of this uh, 20 years is that nobody can resolve this issue either on their own or bilaterally or simply through specific, uh, say, alliance uh, um, relationships. It is important, but it's not enough. Because every time you pull out this thread and you think that this is the one that will lead you uh, to the, the goal you are looking for, uh, it suddenly is blocked, it just uh, breaks or it's just stuck. And uh, at the end of the day, we have the situation where too many people who have been dealing with these issues uh, honestly believe and say so that I did more than I had to, it's hopeless, it cannot be resolved. I mean, let's do something else more realistic and everything. So you have to answer yourself, is this really, this option is available? The answer is obvious, no. Because absolutely the way the things continue to go, and this is where this East Asia comes into the picture, the way they take their time, they see time and space. I mean, all these things completely different. No overnight solutions. Everything has to be done like this. There's a lot of patience, consistency and focus. So uh, I really think that I can see uh, hopeful signs here and there. It's not only in South Korea, where people, uh, and I'm not going to qualify the policies of the incumbent president in the Republic of Korea, because I promise not to do so. But I would also disagree with those who think that uh, uh, whatever they say about it, uh, I believe people should understand the rationale behind this policy, as well as realize that the policy did not reach its stated objectives. So the only question they have to ask themselves and others, why? So, but I again agree with the Dean that, uh, uh, yes, dialogue. If people now talk about meaningful dialogue. We have been always uh, calling it meaningful dialogue or engagement. Uh, it has to be multilateral in combination with bilateral. Uh, and this is exactly what the, set, uh, the six party talks framework has been providing or was supposed to provide. Unfortunately, it sort of uh, is not functioning since December 2008. So, in order to resume it, I hope it can be resumed you despite the uh, persistent claims by the DPRK about what they think they are, they want to be, and why, uh, because otherwise it will be very difficult to find another platform for this engagement and dialogue and negotiations. I believe, and this is where I cannot uh, speak out in public, I believe that those who will make decisions should know or should come to some conclusions why the previous efforts did not succeed. Because again, I have to agree, the way I understand um, uh, what's going on in North Korea, their leadership uh, continues to have as number one priority the survival of their system. Like every other uh, state in the world, uh, or most other states in the world. Uh, and they found this way of ensuring their survival and security. Uh, claiming that nothing else uh, guarantees is better than having the self-deterrence and so on and so forth. We know that, uh, again, on the, from the experience of the last two decades, uh, 
this is not really the answer. There are better ways of guaranteeing and ensuring your security. But that requires uh, becoming part of a uh, bigger community. Uh, I mean, if not fully of the international community, but then engaging with it. And, uh, but as they say, it's a two-way street. So uh, this word will be the specific challenge for the diplomats. And uh, first of all, uh, when they will try, as I believe, uh, this re-engagement uh, very soon uh, to obtain. Uh, I will add uh, one thing uh, without waiting for any uh, question, uh, because uh, unfortunately one of the um, uh, negative things that happened, uh, uh, and I'm talking now as a UN official, where we absolutely disconnect humanitarian issues from political and security, is the fact that uh, uh, there is a very serious humanitarian situation in North Korea which affects uh, millions of people there. And unfortunately, those who are the most vulnerable, who are in no position uh, to get help from anywhere, uh, for many reasons, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about it, because uh, if you follow this issue, it should be clear. This is the time where uh, normally the international community comes to help those the most vulnerable and who have nothing to do with the policies I mean, of any government uh, or state. Uh, but we have, uh, for the last several years, the situation where we have to reduce and cut literally life-saving programs uh, uh, on the ground in North Korea. And uh, we have to do it because uh, the UN uh, does not have the resources of its own. We rely on member states, on donors. And uh, those governments, uh, uh, they decide where and how to spend the money because everybody needs the resources these days. I mean, everybody has problems. And we are uh, finding ourselves with regard to North Korea almost in an impossible situation where just uh, even the absolute minimum of the programs we have, uh, and they're actually approved by uh, the member state, the donors, uh, countries themselves, uh, are financed as of today for this year, for example, uh, at 52% uh, only. So uh, this is the, really the point that we don't hear much because uh, uh, let's be uh, open. Uh, nobody likes what's going on uh, in that part of the Korean Peninsula when you talk to donors uh, about the public opinion, the elected representatives. And the people say, well, uh, we are trying, but it's really the responsibility of the government. Well, uh, of course, we can wait until this ch situation changes, but we at the UN believe that uh, we should not wait. I mean, if we should help these people. Not in anticipation of any changes in political behavior anywhere. No, just on its own merit. Thank you very much, and uh, I look forward uh, to the other real experts uh, after the dean and the two professors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fred? Um, I thought that uh, coming last, that uh, uh, everything that could be said about the elections, uh, upcoming elections in South Korea would have been said already. And, and I could uh, just say amen to what had gone before. But uh, since um, uh, nothing has been said about it, let me uh, directly, let me just make a few beginning comments on the elections. I think that um, one of the, uh, of course, the great drama that uh, has been removed from the scene is the possibility of, uh, you know, two opposition candidates competing with uh, one uh, uh, ruling party candidate or successor to the ruling party candidate. And um, um, all of the recriminations that would follow on that process because, you know, that was considered by all parties to be an absolute uh, sure, um, assurance, to give absolute assurance that the um, conservative candidate Park Geun-hye would have won the election. So we had all of this, uh, all of this drama to find a um, unified candidate for the um, opposition side uh, between Mr. Moon, Moon Jae-in, and uh, An Chao Su. And um, suddenly it fizzled out, and the, the, the effort was over, and. Uh, 
uh, if you're an optimist, you say, well, they, they found a way to unify the opposition, and Moon Jae-in will go ahead now and register as a candidate, and so it's just a two-way race. But more than actually, rather than actually being a uh, solution to the problem of uh, disunity on the opposition side, it was just sort of a, a collapse. And, uh, and as a result, um, what we really have is a two-way race, but with um, the, uh, the supporters of the third candidate who's dropped out um, as a um, uh, unknown factor in, in the outcome. So it's a kind of three-way race still in, in de facto. And uh, the initial uh, polling suggests that 50% uh, of, <clears throat> of the third party uh, Candidate supporters have gone to uh, to Mr. Moon, 25% to um, the conservative candidate. But then there's this rather large category. It's probably not 25%, but at least maybe 10% or perhaps more, who are just like in our own elections, the independents, the undecided, who are going to determine the outcome of the election. So in a, in a sense, uh, Mr. An has now become, you know, the uh, factor in the outcome of the election, even though he's not one of the candidates. So it's, it's a, from one point of view, you could call it a, um, it certainly makes for an interesting uh, uh, three weeks that remain in the, in the campaign, but it also virtually ensures that uh, nobody is going to be happy with the outcome of the election. And therefore, if they're not happy, um, it'll probably be uh, one hopes it won't be quite the same as in our Congress, uh, but there may be a sort of um, unwillingness to come together and try to uh, uh, resolve problems in what um, uh, they're calling the new politics. That you know, in other words, the um, effort to move away from old politics, which is what we're basically left with in this two-way race, uh, has. Um, not uh, been translated into the campaign, but remains as part of the agenda going f forward. And so if the conservative candidate, Park Geun-hye, wins, and so far in the aftermath of, of what's happened, uh, she's uh, still running ahead of uh, her opposition, then, um, uh, you know, the, the question of whether all of the promises that have been made that uh, are virtually identical between uh, her party and the opposition party, uh, whether they will actually be carried out as promised or not will rise to the surface. And a great um, aspect of that, one element in that, is going to be how the relationship between the US and South Korea plays out. And, um, but in even a broader sense, um, you have to, at a minimum, bring Japan and China into the picture as well. And um, of course, the relationship with China will be important regardless of what the outcome is, because from the um, point of view of just about all political actors in the Korean Peninsula, um, there's some need to do what we're talking about, a rebalancing or a pivot to Asia, well, there, there's a need from their point of view, uh, from what I read anyway, uh, for a rebalancing between the US and China. And then on the other side, Japan has become a sort of um, loose cannon, or I don't know what, what, how to describe the uncertainties that are now introduced into the equation by the, um, the possibility, probability, uh, that the uh, more hard right elements in Japan will come back into power and uh, even with even some discussion of the possibility of uh, revisiting the issue of their nuclear status and all kinds of other uh, potentially very disruptive things. So I think that there's, um, there's, there's, there's all of these uncertainties that are not going to be just quickly resolved by the outcome of the election. And really, part of the reason they're not going to be is the deep cultural and historical roots of all of these different currents and trends that are coming together. Um, 
and really, indeed, this election, as many people have pointed, is kind of like a, a proxy for um, uh, Park Geun-hye's father's uh, race with uh, Kim Dae-jung, or you know, it's sort of like um, repeating uh, historic contests between um, the more the military and conservative. Um, more right of center elements, authoritarian elements. People forget that, you know, I lived through the whole Yushin period, which was, you know, the early 70s uh, until uh, Park chung hees assassination in, uh, in, in the late 70s. And actually the first 25 years or more since the military revolution in 1961, um, there was a military authoritarian government in South Korea that had, was certainly um, <clears throat> different than the one in the North, but it had a lot more commonalities with the North than it did with the United States, as, as the late Senator Solar, uh, Congressman Solars or others could tell you in great detail because they were coming to Korea all the time very upset about this, this, this state of democracy in South Korea. So um, this is a kind of, we're still fighting that old not in exactly the same terms, but there's very much of this uh, element of light, right versus left, which is, is part of the cultural heritage of uh, really the 20th century in Korea, the late 19th to the 20th century, uh, end of the 20th century. And uh, it sh everyone believes that it should be a thing of the past, uh, the, particularly the 20s and uh, people in their 20s and 30s that were the strongest supporters of Mr. Ahn, the third party, the third candidate who dropped out of the race, um, <clears throat> are just so sick of all that left-right kind of stuff, all that uh, rehashing of history and all of the, the um, cultural baggage that goes along with it that they would uh, really like to um, press the reset button and have a very, very different Korea. And um, that different Korea that they want wouldn't necessarily even have to include North Korea. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a, the, 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 how they imagine the Korea of the future is um, a, a, one of the more interesting issues that, you know, that is not being probably examined enough. Um, but what they mostly don't want is the continuing uh, interconnecting sort of struggle between people of the left and people of the right. That's the heritage that they've um, uh, decided that they want to reject. And um, unfortunately, the, the problem is that it's not just this, this d debate within South Korea, but it's also, of course, debate between North and South Korea. Because if, if um, you know, you might reject those of the opposite persuasion from you in South Korea, but what do you do if you extend that? What happens if you extend that same sort of mentality uh, to the North? Well. Uh, and then, and then, of course, the other issue is from the position, the perspective of many people in, in, in South Korea, actually people even on the, more on the right end of the political spectrum, they're not sure they want to be a f fully engaged in what is being called the pivot to Asia or rebalancing because they're concerned about what that means in terms of how the relationship with China and with, with other uh, equities they have in the region will work out. I've, I hear that all the time from people. So um, how you sort out all of these things is really the big unsolved question. And I think that um, the, the, the interesting thing going forward is that if an election doesn't move uh, the agenda forward on these fundamental issues or the definitions of what the Korea of the future should be, then you have to ask yourself, how do you go about doing it? And um, so the, um, you know, the, all of the uh, candidates have said that, that um, they would uh, promote this uh, uh, homogenizing or uh, uh, pacifying uh, uh, mood in the country by um, uh, what they call uh, market democratization. Uh, even people that have been supportive of what we call 
uh, you know, laissez-faire market type of capitalism, you're talking about market democratization. Uh, there's no distinction between the conservative candidate and the uh, progressive candidate in terms of, of the welfare state, their commitment to the welfare state, to these policies that uh, promote uh, uh, in in income equality. I mean, they have a whole rash of what I call the contemporary uh, Simeon Stylites types of people. You know, the, the uh, Simeon Stylites was that, that monk that positions himself on a column in, in uh, Syria, in Aleppo, near Aleppo, in uh, what, in the fifth century, uh, to sort of uh, make a commentary on the state of society and how you get to a better place. And um, we've got uh, five, I think, at the moment, four or five, um, industrial actions where uh, workers have climbed to the tops of uh, high pylons and other things to sort of uh, uh, raise people's consciousness by literally raising, the, raising their body to a higher level. So that's one, uh, you know, extra, that's not the electoral process or whatever, but it's having a, feed, that there's a feedback me mechanism involved there. And so, you know, if the uh, election uh, actually results in, the, in what, um, to use the um, famous terminology of Park, uh, Park Chang-hee, Hamintenda, if you do it, it's done. That kind of, of, of uh, just deci decisive decision making. So, you know, uh, uh, Park Geun hee would be the, I mean, uh, yes, Park Geun hee would be the obvious person to do that. It's her own father's <laughs> saying and something that he actually acted on. Uh, but, um, you know, even on the other side of the, uh, the equation, there's an enormous amount of com a commitment of Kim Dae-jung's, uh, um, uh, what shall we say, idealism or uh, optimism in uh, starting the whole sunshine uh, policy approach is another example of it. So I think that whether, that whether people will, you know, continue to, um, uh, will take from the election this conviction that uh, if we really want to find a solution, we can break away from the constrictors of the past and so forth, then uh, we'll see what will happen. And it'll have, it perhaps as Dean Steinberg said, uh, if they approach the United States the right way, one would hope that the Obama administration would be supportive of whatever uh, new ways of thinking and acting that they may want to put into place. But there's a big if, and it's related to all of the other relationships in the region that will have to be rebalanced. And, um, you know, the other day, um, uh, 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 what's his name, the uh, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia, uh, Kirk. Kirk, Kirk Campbell said at Georgetown, when he was asked by Chris Hill, one of his predecessors, um, what are we calling it these days? Is it not pivot or is it rebalance? And he said, no, it's pirouette, which obviously I didn't think he meant to be taken literally, but I think that he, it, I took it anyway as a sign that there's a certain degree of frustration about how we actually put all this thing together, all of this together, and make it really work in a way that's not counterproductive. That's the challenge that South Korea is involved in as well, and hopefully they'll work together with the United States and others to uh, uh, bring about a different set of relationships in an area that actually are responsive to, um, you know, if you. Eat the, eat the maum, as they say in Korea, maum mogaya. You have to eat the maum, the will to do it, and then something can happen. There's a, a, attitudes in the Korean that are very, very strongly expressed. Whether the deed can follow the thought is, is the question. Great, thanks, Brad. Um, okay, well, thanks all of you, and I think now it's, if it's okay, yeah, open up, maybe, you want to, maybe you have two minutes, so yeah. yeah. So I, 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 I think it's important <laughs> to maybe say a bit more, which Fred, uh, help, helpfully got us to focus on what, what's going on in the political discussion in South Korea, because I think there are two important things that I just want to both agree with and, and emphasize, which is one, um, this election is not about North-South relations, right? This is, this is very much about the character of South Korean society and, and this whole market democratization and equality and opportunity and, and small business and entrepreneurship and and all that, and sort of what kind of society the South wants to make. But what, what's entailed in that, and Fred also said it, but I want to draw it out a little bit, is 
I, I think, a deep indifference to the North-South relationship at the end of the day, which is that in some ways for many, especially younger South Koreans, it's just not relevant. The unification vision, maybe you wave your hand at it, maybe you don't, but it's just not relevant. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody's trying to figure out how you get there. I mean, I spent a lot of time with the unification minister, and there's a little pot of money, and we all throw our money into how we're going to, I mean, it's, and with all due respect, and I respect him a lot, I mean, it's unimaginable for most South Koreans that this would actually happen, that we would have to pay for this and deal with all these things, and that there's sort of a kind of, you know, in this, a similarity between a lot of the dynamic in the Germanys, which is that it just, it's just unthinkable. Not that it won't happen, but it's just that nobody's really thinking about what it would mean to really get there and how you would do it and how, what it would take to make it happen. And so this is about perfecting, improving, dealing with the challenges internal to South Korea. And yes, there's some debate and there are platforms about that, but precisely the reason I think that the, the, the two candidates or the three candidates before they had basically similar language is because there wasn't, wasn't a lot of focus one way or the other. There was no need to distinguish yourself that much on North-South policy because it was all fighting for the who has the most reformist view about how to perfect South Korea. So on the one hand, it means that there's an opening. On the other hand, whether there's this energy or real desire to do it. And if you want to be back on the pessimistic side, I think one of my concerns would be precisely because I think the next South Korean president is going to be so focused on these internal issues that there will be a temptation in the North to try to get people's attention back to the North-South agenda. And so, uh, but I, I think it is quite important because we obviously, I mean, many of you are very knowledgeable about the internal domestic situation in South Korea, but because for us, Americans who don't really know much or have that much of a stake in these internal debates about the character of South Korean society, we tend to sort of latch on to what's the difference between uh, Mrs. Park and, and Mr. Moon on these things, whereas, you know, you tell me, Fred, but I don't see any signs in my visits there that, that the choices that will be made have much to do with this. May I, may I just add one thing? I, I can't resist it. Um, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Um, uh, um, Lee Gun Hee, the head of chairman of Samsung, famously said some years ago, um, and there's something like "Manura paku begu ta in the war." Except for my wife, I'm going to change everything. And and people actually think that he did that, and that's why we have the Samsung that we have today. And actually, that is exactly the position that, that Korea is in right now. <laughs> Except for their wife, they have to change everything and uh, you know, get somewhere. Questions? Let me just remind everyone that this is being webcast and archived, so what you say matters, okay? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, the microphone's coming to you. Thank you very much. In following up on just those last two comments, <clears throat> you you've all three seem to say the status quo seems to stay the same, but the future is, and, and that goes to this statement, since the armistice, isn't watching Northeast Asia sort of like uh, a diplomatic version of professional wrestling? North Korea commits an outrage. The, the players all flex their muscles. There's negotiations, and then you just rewind the tape. And what I want you to do is tell us why that is, and tell us why, why in th those statements you just made, uh, because I'll offer you up this. It just seems to provide a lot of employment for diplomats, think tanks, now get serious, the arms industry, armies, and, and to support that conspiracy theory, look at the six powers. Each of them benefit by the present status quo. And you'd say, well, so what? But it's cruel. It's cruel to the people of South Korea. It really is. I asked the same question in a more abbreviated manner to the ambassador of, uh, the South Korean ambassador to New Zealand once in a small forum. And I was flabbergasted at his answer. He said, for humanitarian reasons, we didn't use the hard approach from 92 to 93. We didn't use the hard approach because our, our, uh, 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 our industries wouldn't permit it. They looked at the German experience. And I was just outraged. I felt like saying, you mean the world is suffering from a, a, a North Korean who's a nuclear Walmart. And you think that all we went through since, we could have ended this by using the hard approach and, and all the expense, and it's so costly, wouldn't have, looking back, wouldn't have been better had we, had we ended this thing then with some bold moves. 
and just stop this version of professional wrestling, what I would come back to. I know I've said a lot there, but get us to the why this crazy situation permit, is permitted. Thank you. you know, I, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what you said, except for the last bit about whether there were some hard moves that could have been made in 92, 93, because I'm not sure that I know what those are. Um, I mean, people looked at them. I can't say 92, 93, but I can certainly say 93, 94 when I was there. You know, and the problem is that the risks of those hard moves were very high. It might have worked, but it might have had a conflagration that nobody knew how it was going to turn out. So I think that is easier to answer. On your other point, I think you've hit it exactly right, which is in the near term, the, the apparent benefits of the status quo seem to outweigh the risks of moving. And yet everybody recognizes in the long term that's probably not true. And, and it's so, this is typical of many policy problems, which is how do you bridge the problem between the near term and the long term? And to find a way to reduce the near term risks of moving, but also address the long term risks of not moving. And that's why the point that both Fred and Alexander made about the broader changes in Northeast Asia are so important. It's because if nothing else were changing, then it's probably true everybody would settle for the status quo. I mean, that it's not, it's not very satisfactory, but from a raison d'etat point of view, it would be fine. And I don't think it's conspiratorial. I think it's just rational. I mean, in the sense, you know, the Chinese like the buffer, and they worry about the refugees, and the South worries about the cost of unification, and you know, we worry about if, if North Korea is unified, will become neutral, and does that change the balance? And so there, there, there are plenty of non-venal non reasons why people would like the status quo, except that everybody understands though to different degrees, that the status quo is simply unsustainable, and so you can either wait for it to change of its own, just from some external shock, or you can try to shape it. And I think good thinkers are trying to shape it because they realize that it's gonna get upset. The big question mark in this respect, I think, and this is why I think both of my colleagues are right to talk about the broader context, which I didn't, is gonna be China. Because the, the thing that has kept this mostly in the status quo world is the deep ambivalence that China has about unification and a change in the status quo. I mean, that has been a very important part of China's thinking. It's helped led to the propping up of North Korea. It's insulated North Korea from some of the hard measures that, that you've talked about. There's a lot of discussion today in China, in and out of government, around government, about whether the kind of the core conventional wisdom about China's North Korea policy is right. Do they really need a buffer state? Do they really need a separate North Korea. At the moment that changes, this becomes a very, very different world because, I mean, it's clearly easier to think about a set of solutions that may be imperfect, but it's, it's a different configuration in a world in which China becomes proactive in supporting unification as opposed to kind of ambivalent, kind of negative, anti-nuclearization, but worried about the consequences of what a non-nuclear North needs. So I, I think you're right to say that all the parties have important reasons to not want to deal with the underlying problem, but I think most of them understand that there are also pretty substantial long-term risks if they keep playing the status quo game. Uh, uh, may I respond? Yes. Um, let me respond from what I understand to be the North Korean position. If, if I heard you correctly, it sounded like you were saying all the problems were basically due to North Korea, its provocations, its maybe its very existence. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, you wouldn't be surprised to hear from me that North Koreans don't agree with that point of view. That, um, you know, they, in fact, their basic position, and they really reiterated it very strongly last August in a very lengthy memo, is that um, they see the source of the problem the horrendous security uh, challenges that they face because of the United States' uh, refusal to uh, recognize their right to exist, the, the, recognize the fact that they're a sovereign state. And um, you know, they don't consider that the U.S.'s judgment that they don't live a decent enough life to be recognized as legitimate uh, they, they, they don't recognize the United States' right to make that determination. And then lastly, I'll just say this. You, uh, they will say, you probably don't know as, as much as you think you know about what the internal dynamics of their state are in terms of human rights and that sort of thing. And indeed, I mean, you know, uh, uh, we live with Saudi Arabia and a lot of other places, Pakistan and so forth, that are not exactly paragons of, of 
virtue in terms of human rights from our perspective. So why are we making such a particular case of North Korea? And they say it goes back to the unresolved issues of the Korean War and our whole initial engagement in that region. And they think that we're trying to reiterate that kind of engagement through something like this pivot to Asia. We're trying to reinvent that kind of Cold War scenario. I'm not saying that I think that's what the U.S. government's intention is, but I'm saying they think that, and I think probably the Chinese, a lot of the Chinese seem to agree. Thanks, Mark. Any other questions, especially from someone who does not have gray hair? Is there anyone that, uh, any of the students have, or others want to have a question or comment to make? I wasn't specifically talking about you, talking about me. <laughs> All right, then anyone can ask a question. <laughs> Anything else? Any comments from you that you'd like to? Yeah, I would like to just to reiterate the point Was that uh, one of the biggest challenges, I first of all don't know too many diplomats or experts who are really uh, uh, spend the uh, 724 I mean, on these issues. This is not a high priority uh, set of issues. This is one of the problems. Just because uh, any politician, any high level diplomat, I mean, when you don't see in, uh, chances of success to be sort of realistically uh, high enough, uh, you try to avoid these kind of issues. Uh, so when you said that why certain bold, uh, bold moves or steps were not taken, uh, well, I don't know again uh, as uh, uh, Jean Steinberg said what you're referring to. But uh, the, one of the things that changed dramatically uh, as of today, uh, it's not an option anymore. Whatever people were considering under certain circumstances in 93, 94 maybe, it's gone. This situation is one of the, I mean, we're dealing with the world where uh, too many things are not clear. Too many challenges uh, don't have a ready answer. Uh, you really have to look for them. You have to work for them. You have to know the limit of what is possible, uh, what is not possible. These things are new uh, to our generation. Uh, they are not new to the coming generation. Uh, they will deal with them uh, from their vantage point. But this is what we know, their limits what can be done by the things that were uh, used and actually worked some time ago. This is a different world, and it promises to, be, to go this way even more. But what we also learned on the positive side, there are ways of dealing with these challenges. Uh, they're not necessarily the use of force, um, uh, coercive measures uh, uh, on their own. Uh, you should also have real diplomacy real engagement, real dialogue. It's the world is not black and white. You know, it has much more shades in there. And when you look at the world uh, through these kind of lenses, then solutions, some solutions uh, become uh, realistic and possible. They're not easy. They're not easy, but they're possible. As long as you know what is really the priority, what is the most important to go for. So people were waiting during these 20 years for many things that never happened, right? They simply never happened. People were convinced, even several years ago, where they were certain, just wait just a little bit, it's going to happen. Well, guess what? Nothing of that kind. It's the opposite. So um, we have to, to look at the world the way it is, to be realistic about it. And being, frankly, optimistic, because uh, there is no way when you have uh, people doing their work and effort together, and I mean it, the best times uh, in recent times between, of course, we have one of the best experts in the world on China sitting right to me. Uh, I mean it. Um, you made a huge investment, given looking at this, uh, not looking, dealing with this emerging relationship between the United States and China and focusing, focusing on the positive, constructive part of that equation. Because it really will depend on what people will see in that glass, how it will evolve. 
you want to see it uh, in a certain way, you will have actually China friendly. You will have China as a friend, even as a superpower. You look at it from a different perspective, then uh, God help us all, as I say. So the same is here, much smaller scope. And that's why it's easier. The best times of the US-China relationships were the times of real close collaboration on the peninsula issues. The best. The best. It's just another lesson that the stakes here are not simply the peninsula, nuclear, non-nuclear, I mean unified, it's unified. Let the Koreans decide it. At the end of the day, we all see that the Koreans will decide the fate of their nation, when and how they're going to do it. We should simply help them. But before that time comes, we have to deal with the issues that belong elsewhere as well. So, uh, but only working together in a real sense, we will get there. So whether it promises more job for professional diplomats, and I'm, a, I'm just about to expire in that <laughs> sense. So I, I, I really want uh, the diplomacy to become the real profession again. Not for the uh, you know, elected uh, uh, top executives you know, to make decisions, listening, okay, okay, this is the way we'll go. Ah, it didn't work, okay. Uh, why don't we try this one? No, no, no. Diplomacy is not about that. It's about Policymakers define the and decide on the policy. And the real diplomats, they implement it. They make it a reality. Yeah, I've read a little bit. Let me Thanks. just make a, because I think it's a very important point here, which applies not just to North Korea and the Korean Peninsula, but more broadly. Big changes don't happen because there's some creative you know, formula. I mean, we didn't have the rapprochement between the United States and China because they found out the words in the Shanghai Declaration. They found out the words of the Shanghai Declaration because it was a strategic decision by both sides that their interests were served by changing the character of that relationship. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I've been a diplomat too, but this is rarely about the, the formalities of diplomacy. And what's critical here, and it goes back to Fred's point about North Korea's perceptions of insecurity and blah, 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 is that what this will change when each of the characters change their view about what their national interests are. And so at the point in which the North decides it has a better chance of preserving the regime by engagement and moving forward on these agendas with the, with the South and with others, then you know, using the external enemy to validate the internal thing, then there's a chance of change. And this, the, 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 the challenge for policy is to try to create the context in which they will make that decision through affirmative and negative incentives that allows them to say, gee, we accept the fact that all states are interested in regime survival. We want to affect it. I mean, the reasons things changed in Alexander's country is because the leadership decided that the survival of the regime or Russia or whatever needed a, it, it needed a radical rethink about how it engaged in the world. And so that's what we need to do. And that's why I put so much emphasis on China's thinking about this, because at the point in which the Chinese leadership become deeply convinced that this is really not in their interest either. Then I think the ability to, to really reshape the context, because there is an ambivalence there which does create a set of choices for the North Koreans which are not good ones. They have a choice of kind of continuing to rely on the protection of China, the economic support of China, they just kind of muddle along rather than to face the kind of internal contradictions there. And you know, we, we can make a difference in their calculus that way. It's not a question of threatening, it's not a question of diplomacy, it's a question of how does each state perceive its national interest? Why did big things change? Why did Sadat go to Israel? They all changed because the geopolitical context of the decision making changed and they made decisions from their perspective about national interest that were very different and were a rupture from the past. But I mean, I, I, let me just add one thing. I think we'll have to have a discussion afterwards if you don't mind with the reception because we're running out of time in terms of the room. But I, I, I would want to say, Jim, that while national interest matters, it doesn't matter in a freestanding kind of material way. Our national interests get redefined based upon, in part, how we frame our world. And that world framing comes, in part, from the kind of things we're doing right now, engaging with people from other countries, other perspectives, yeah, I agree. and I, that reshapes I, the language. I, what I'm resisting, Stu, is the notion, I mean, it's, it's, I have a lot of respect for diplomats, but you know, uh, it is also true that you could be at this 24-7 and be creative, and you can be Chris Hill or Dennis Ross or whatever, and you're not going to solve the problem if, the, if, if you allow me. The objective circumstances are not ones which you know, would lead 
leaders to make the decisions. I mean, we have a lot of talk about rational leaders, not rational leaders. They're all rational in their own terms, right? So you have to affect the terms in which they're, they're rational. Do you want to we'll just give your question then? Yeah. yeah. Please. I wanted to comment. I was struck with the idea that everybody got struck with the observations that seem to be agreement that uh, most of the parties are satisfied enough with the status quo not to risk trying to do something. Um, maybe the strategy is to just everybody should make the status quo a little more comfortable um, and not try to change anything very radically, but make it more comfortable. There are humanitarian issues. If uh, North Korea were a little more comfortable, maybe it would be a little more relaxed about being more open. It would solve some problems. And nobody was trying to make any big change. And in the course of that, change would happen. The, the problem, but but there, there are so many interlocking issues. So, I mean, broadly, that has been the strategy. But there are certain parts of the status quo which are not acceptable. So, I mean, there, there are consequences to the North Korean nuclear program which are both regional and extra regional. And so it's not, from the US perspective, I mean, and I, it is not a plausible policy thing to simply say, OK, this is like India and Pakistan. They got nukes. North Korea has nukes. Let's just live with it, OK? We can, we can live with it. There's, there was a lot of debate at one time about whether we should switch from a, a denuclearization agenda to a nonproliferation agenda vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. You keep them as long as you don't give them to anybody else. But the consequences for Iran, for others, are so big that we're not comfortable doing that. So what it would take to be comfortable is not as quite as easy as maybe your question implies. Uh, with, with that, let's, let's break for reception. I want, but Alexander has agreed kindly to be up in Moynihan with the Russian table beginning at 3 o'clock. So if you'd like to speak to him more about this, but in Russian, um, <laughs> go on upstairs uh, and carry on the conversation. Otherwise, enjoy some whatever is back there. Thanks so much for coming. We really appreciate it. And to the panel as well.